Welcome back to my channel. My name is Michael Ryan. For those of you who are new, I am the creator of Mikemon Regions on Instagram and Twitter, where I share my two fake Mon regions, the Loiko region and the Firin region. I am so glad to be back. I know it's been a while, but I've been chipping away at this video for a very, very long time, and I'm excited because in it, I am going to be introducing and exploring my Pokemon Legends inspired project, Pokemon Legends Realm Doll, with a brand new region, the Cedar region, which is a past version of my newest fake Mon region, the one I've been exploring here on YouTube, the Fearin region. With it, I'll be introducing a bunch of new ancestors, regional forms for classic Pokemon and evolutions, as well as some new forge forms. So I'm so excited to dive into that. There's so much to explore and cover. This is a long video, my biggest one yet. Um, it goes really in depth and I'm so excited to take this to the next level with you guys and finally share all of this. I was so inspired by Pokemon Legends Arceus, as I'm sure many of you were. It was such a great game, one of the best Pokemon games and experiences I've had in such a long time. I was up literally all night playing it the moment it came out and for days. When I was playing it, all I could think of was this project. The ideas rushed to my head and I put them on paper and now here we are and I hope you guys all enjoy this project. I could go on forever. Um, here's Pokemon Legends Realm Doll. First, I wanted to give a quick recap for any newcomers of my fake Mon region, known as the Firin region. As this Legends-inspired project and the Cedar region featured in this video takes place in a past version of the Firin region, long ago at the time of its first settlement. The Firin region is inspired by Scandinavia and Norse mythology, with the majority of the region's culture, geography, and wildlife resembling that of Iceland. The region features over 115 brand new Pokemon, as well as new regional forms and evolutions for classic Pokemon, and a brand new battle mechanic known as Forge Forms, offering unique magical weapon variations of several fan favorite Pokemon, as well as the new native Pokemon of the region. The Fearin region's hypothetical and who knows maybe one day future fan games would be known as Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn, with its story focusing on duality and division as you'd be pitted against your childhood best friend as you've both been recruited by rival teams, Team Brain and Team Brawn, in the middle of their high-stakes turf war throughout the Firin region. So in other words, there are two evil teams, and you're actually part of one of the teams for a change, as you must not only compete in the Firin League Gym Challenge as one of the main campaigns of the game, but there'd be a separate campaign where you'd have to defeat and recruit random trainers throughout the region onto your respective team, some of which may take a little more convincing, forcing you to complete various side quests. And of course you would be rewarded handsomely as well for your efforts. Anyways, in order to fully understand and appreciate this video, or to simply learn more about the Firin region, make sure to check out some of my previous videos and follow my Instagram account, at Michaelmon underscore regions, as I'm not even halfway through posting the Firin region. So in other words, there's still plenty more to come for the Firin region in the future. Explore the Firin region's ancient past. Long before the events of Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn, when it was known as the Mysterious Cedar Region. After being rescued from out at sea, to survive this dangerous new world, you must travel alongside the region's first group of settlers, the Revered Voyage Clan, a group of raiders determined to find and acquire as many Pokemon as possible, having already done so in various other regions. They will even gift you with one of the Pokemon they have plundered to help assist you on your adventure. At a time where most people feared Pokemon, the Voyage Clan saw their potential and used them as weapons to conquer new lands. After discovering a strange power on their expedition, the Voyage Clan even found a way to transform some of their Pokemon into literal weapons. However, some of the clan have seemed to notice these forged weapons' true strength comes from the bond shared between people and the very Pokemon they seek to wield. This is dividing the clan as many have started to question the nature of the relationship between people and Pokemon. While others are wondering where this miraculous power came from, it seems something or someone is testing you. So that begs the question, are you worthy of wielding a Pokemon? It is important to note that all the key features introduced in Pokemon Legends Arceus, such as its unique capture mechanics, roaming Pokemon, alpha Pokemon, agile and strong style attacks, riding Pokemon, the more RPG style boss battles, as well as the trainer being able to faint, whether by wild Pokemon attacks or falling off a cliff, etc. will all be featured in this game, this hypothetical game of course, with a few new features as well to add upon it and its lure 
including a brand new battle mechanic known as Forge Forms, something I'm sure most of you who already follow my page know about, but for those of you who don't, I'll get more into that later. And of course, this Legends project would have to introduce a variety of new characters, including ancestors of classic Pokemon characters, as that was a huge selling point of Pokemon Legends Arceus. This would be no exception, except it would also draw from original characters from my fake one regions, primarily the Firin region, which this region will later become. So let's start by taking a look at the heroes of the game. Introducing the protagonists of Pokemon Legends Realm Doll, Astrid and Sven. These two heroes are meant to resemble the modern day Firin protagonists, Emma and Eric, as well as their mother, Professor Aspen with some good old Viking elements incorporated into their designs, as this story takes place in what is meant to resemble the Viking expansion. They sport light skin and blonde hair, as that is common throughout Scandinavian countries. Like in Pokemon Legends Arceus, the hero will come from an undisclosed place in the future and be found out at sea by the Voyage Clan, which are essentially Viking settlers made up of people from various different regions, one of which being the Cedar region's acting Pokemon professor, Professor Sarah Magnolia, hailing from the recently conquered Galar region. If you couldn't tell, this character is an ancestor to Professor Magnolia of the Galar region and her granddaughter Sonia. Despite disagreeing with some of their more questionable methods, Professor Magnolia joined Team Voyage for the opportunity to explore new regions and learn everything she can about Pokemon. Unlike the rest of Team Voyage, Professor Magnolia truly believes human and Pokemon can live together in harmony and wants your help to prove this to be possible. Unconditionally kind and nurturing, Professor Magnolia will treat you as if you were her own child, assisting you however possible throughout your journey in the Cedar region. After being found out at sea and welcomed into the Voyage Clan, Professor Magnolia will gift you with one of the starter Pokemon, Chespin, Tepig, or Pipluck. All three of these Pokemon, as mentioned before, were plundered from other regions by Team Voyage and will be your greatest defense against the dangerous Pokemon that roam the Cedar region. Just like in Pokemon Legends Arceus, all three starters will get new regional forms and types for their final stages. Since the starter regional forms for the Legends Arceus trio didn't change all that much, it was important to me not to deviate too much from the original designs as well when creating these. I picked the three starter Pokemon I personally felt fit the Icelandic wild wildlife and viking setting the best. I also needed three starters I could come up with a shared theme for, which is a lot easier said than done. But I could not be more pleased with how all three of these designs turned out, so I'd like to give a big shout out to the talented artist Fake Mans for helping me bring these concepts to life. So let's have a look at those. First up we have the grass starter, Sidereon Chestnut, supporting a new grass steel typing. Its large spiky fists are strong enough to demolish a fortress wall. While a force to be reckoned with, it can also take hits as its sturdy iron shell can withstand a bomb blast. It keeps its spiky armored shell, but now takes some inspiration from Viking shields and armor with a darker and more muted color palette. While its armor is still a big part of its design, I wanted to focus more on its new spiky mace-like arms as it is now more offensive than its original form which was more of an offensive mod. Its signature move, Iron Thorn Strike, is essentially a Steel-type equivalent to Hisoian Samurott's signature move, Ceaseless Edge, as it leaves behind Iron Thorns, which will continue to damage the foe for several turns. Next up, we have the Fire Starter, Sidereon Embor. Embor absorbs heat from deep within the earth by burying its fists into the ground. Its mood can be determined by the intensity of its flaming beard. Embor loses its fighting typing in exchange for the ground typing. I know people like to try to poke holes and point out the obvious, but yes, I am aware Pig Knight is a fire fighting, but Dartrix goes from grass flying to grass ghost or grass fighting in Legends Arceus after evolving into Decidueye. And there are weirder things to have happened in Pokemon like Cubone going from ground type to ghost fire type after evolving into a lowland Marowak. Anyways, now taking inspiration from one of the battle boars from Norse mythology, Hildesvini, and Iceland's volcanoes evident in its more earthy color palette, and even more so in its new moveset with moves such as Lava Plume and Earth Power. Its signature move, Volcanic Crash, is a ground type equivalent to Hisuian Typhlosion's signature move, Infernal Parade, doing more damage when the target has a status condition such as a burn. Sidereon Embor keeps its bulky design, but like Sidereon Chestnut has darker, more muted colors, and Norse inspiration incorporated into its design, like the hair braids on top of its head, and of course the Norse symbols across its belly and the rest of its design. 
the water starter, Sidereon, and Polion swaps out its steel typing for the ice typing, as its design is now inspired by Valkyries. Prideful, it gracefully dives off cliffs and icebergs with excellent form. It descends upon its foes in a glorious fury, masterfully using the razor-sharp edges of its wings. Sidereon and Polion's signature move, Glacial Descent, is an ice-type variant of Hisuian Decidueye's signature move, Triple Arrows, lowering the target's defense stat and increasing the chances of landing critical hits in the future. This design features some lighter icy blues to really help sell its new ice typing, but the colors still look somewhat muted to help give it that battle-worn feel shared between the other two starters. With beautiful gold blade-like wings and a gorgeous headpiece resembling that worn by Valkyries, I wanted this design to look as majestic as possible. Also, as I'm sure you noticed, these three starters also have a new type triangle, with Chestnut Steel typing super effective against Empoleon's Ice typing, and Empoleon's Ice typing super effective against Ambor's Ground typing, and of course, Ambor's Ground typing super effective against Chestnut Steel typing. This type triangle is one that I haven't seen done before, and I've wanted to do for a while now, and a big part of why I picked these three starters, as the concepts and types just came to me. These three starter forms not only share a Norse theme, all of which being battle-related, much like all three of the fully evolved starters of the future Firin region, which by the way, it's important to note that the normal Firin starters would be available in the wild in Pokemon Legends Realmdale, the same way the Sinnoh starters could be caught in the wild of the Hisui region in Pokemon Legends Arceus. Thank you so much for making it this far into the video, I really hope that means you're enjoying it, and the best is yet to come. Please leave a comment down below, let me know what you think, hit the like button, hit that notification bell, and most importantly, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. I'm really looking to make this platform grow and expand my projects on all of my platforms, and all of you are a huge part of that. Your support means everything to me. Thank you so much, and let's get back to it. The Cedar region would be divided into five distinct areas, much like Pokemon Legends Arceus was which would be explored in this order. The Aurora Icelands, the Floral Fieldlands, the Scorched Wastelands, the Rolling Highlands, and the Ebony Islands. Let's start with the Aurora Icelands. In this Arctic area, you'll find snowy slopes, large icy caverns, however, you'll also find a festive snow-topped forest, a series of islands of icebergs, and at night, dazzling northern lights which will paint the sky. Pokemon you'll find in this area include the Route 1 and Early Game Mons, from the future Firin region, which as most of you know are also found in snowy locations. In addition to all of these lines, you'll find plenty of other lines as well, including a new evolution for Bear Arctic known as Pole Arctic. Pole Arctic's Icy Horn acts as a beacon, channeling magical energy and light, reaching its full potential beneath the northern lights. Pole Arctic is evolved from Bear Arctic using a new item called the Arctic Horn, and is meant to mirror Ursaring's new evolution in Pokemon Legends Arceus, Ursa Luna. Like Ursa Luna, Pole Arctic goes from quadrupedal to bipedal. However, unlike Ursa Luna, Pole Arctic is not a riding mon in the Cedar region, as I've decided to replace the item hunting ride mechanic with a brand new one you'll see soon enough. Let's be honest, none of us will miss it. Polar bears can be found in Iceland on icebergs out at sea, so it felt like a natural fit for the region. Polarctic is actually inspired by an Icelandic mythological creature, which is kind of a polar bear unicorn hybrid. Now, I am not even gonna bother to pronounce that, but yes, here it is. Because of this, Polarctic gains the fairy typing, and with it, magical powers. Thanks to its new fairy typing and magical abilities, it has finally been cured of its cold and has now replaced its sinus theme for new icy features to better resemble the Icelandic creature it's modeled after. Here, you'll battle Lord of the Boral, the ice ground type Glacix, a new evolution for Onyx using the white Augamite, much how Cleaver was a new evolution for Scyther using the black Augamite. Often found submerged in large bodies of water, its cold crystallized body is harder than diamonds. Glacix is meant to parallel Cleaver as the first boss, since Onyx and Scyther are kind of a duo, with them already gaining Steel-type evolutions together, Steelix and Scizor, um, but obviously since Cleaver's a Rock-type and Onyx is already a Rock-type, I had to get a little creative. And wanted a new concept and typing that felt at home in the Cedar region. And yes, Glacix is also a reference to Crystal Onyx from the Pokemon anime. 
I couldn't resist. This noble Pokemon, known as an Izer Pokemon in the Cedar region, would use a variety of ice cold attacks you'd have to avoid similar to the Avalog battle in Pokemon Legends Arceus. You'll also find and receive the adorable normal steel type, Cedarian Skiddo in this area. While a peaceful Pokemon, if threatened, it will charge at its foes using its small steel horns to strike. The Voyage Clan uses Skiddo's metallic wool to make armor to help protect them from wild Pokemon. It evolves into Cedarian Go-Goat, the riding mon for Pokemon Legends Realmdale, used to dash around the Cedar region much how you would using Weirdeer in Pokemon Legends Arceus. If it trusts the trainer enough, it will allow them to grip onto its steel horns and ride atop them. It runs across the Rocky Mountain ranges demolishing the ground with its iron hoofs. This line is inspired by Icelandic goats and their long coarse wool. This ancient breed of domestic goat is known as the Settlement Goat, with Norwegian origins dating back to the settlement of Iceland over 1100 years ago, which is why I felt it was perfect for the inclusion of Pokemon Legends Remdel slash the Cedar region as it explores the Viking expansion and the settlement of Iceland. Its new normal steel typing comes from its long coarse wool, which helps protect it from the Cedar region's harsh winters and more aggressive Pokemon. As mentioned in its dex entry, the Voyage Clan uses this wool to make armor, and its horns and hoofs are also made of steel. The normal steel typing, despite having a quadruple weakness to the fighting type, is actually a really good and offensive typing, as it has 10 resistances, 2 immunities, and only 3 weaknesses. The second explorable area in the Cedar region is the Floral Fieldlands. In this large valley, flourishing with a variety of beautiful colored flowers, large open grasslands, and farmlands, Right by the shorelines, gorgeous beaches as well as a fantastical forest filled with a variety of magical Pokemon, primarily fairy types, and you'll find a variety of Furin Pokemon in this area as well as various other classic Pokemon, primarily bug, grass, and flying types. Here you'll battle Lady of the Valley, Izer Pokemon, Sidereian Whimsicott, with its new grass steel typing. Covered in a coat of razor sharp cotton and thorns, while cute, this Pokemon is tough as nails. The changes to Sidere and Whimsicott are subtle, but effective. The biggest change being its new darker color palette. But if you look closely, you'll catch a lot of subtle changes such as its horns having thorns along them and flipped upwards. Its wool is also sharper, and what used to be a wool collar is now replaced with a spiky thorn collar. This mon was chosen to mirror Gen 5 counterpart Lilligant, which got a variant in Pokemon Legends Arceus, and shares the same grass steel typing as the grass starter Sidereen Chestnut to mirror the fact that Hisuian Lilligant shared the same grass fighting type as Legends Arceus grass starter Hisuian Decidueye. This battle would be very similar to the Electroid battle, where you have to constantly avoid a series of cotton spikes floating through the air. To access the remote island this battle takes place on, you'll need help from a new riding Pokemon, Horossi, with the ability to traverse across open waters. This majestic Pokemon shares a strong psychic connection with the ocean, able to make the most of its ever-changing tides and currents. As I'm sure you probably guessed, Horossi is a new water psychic type evolution of Seedra, inspired by yet another mythological Icelandic creature. Two, actually. Both of which resembling aquatic horses. So I thought it would be fun to mix the concepts with a literal seahorse. So as a reference to this, it has some subtle horse-like features in its design like hoof-shaped fins and of course its iconic red mane. However, I wanted to keep a lot of the core elements found from within the rest of the horsey line, so it seemed like a natural evolution and counterpart to Kingdra. The psychic typing comes from its strong connection to both the ocean and its rider. The psychic typing in Pokemon is often used to represent magic, so I figured it would complement Kingdra's dragon type nicely, whereas the other type I debated was the fairy typing, which would totally wreck Kingdra, and I didn't want that. Horasi being the riding Pokemon to traverse the open waters, much how Basque Legion was, allows you to surf along the water at will, and even allows you to access past locations you couldn't before, such as the Iceberg Islands in the Aurora Icelands. Given Iceland is essentially a massive island, and has a deep history with Vikings, which are seafaring warriors, you could expect there to be a lot more water than there was in Pokemon Legends Arceus. You'd be doing quite a bit of surfing, but fear not, there would be a lot more Pokemon, islands, and miscellaneous things out at sea to make your exploration well worth it. And as I'll be getting into shortly, you'll also be able to dive in this game as one of its new mechanics, which will really add some new depth to the game and your experience out at sea. The third area is known as the Scorched Wastelands, full of natural hot springs, geysers, and Iceland's iconic lava fields, 
as well as a massive active volcano with large rivers and pools of lava coursing down it. Here you'll find a variety of fire type lines, as well as the native fear and fire type Pokemon found in the region's future. Some of the new Pokemon you'd be able to catch in this area is Sidereen Spydream. The webbing it spins is said to put those wrapped in it into a deep sleep. It is also used to help spin wool from Sidereen Skiddo or Whimsicott to help make the Voyage Clan protective clothing and armor. As I'm sure a lot of you know, Spydream is actually a Pokemon from my very first fake Mon region, the Luika region. It was originally a bug psychic type inspired by Madagascar's scary Darwin's Bark Spider, an Orb Weaver Spider, and Dream Catchers. Its Sidereen form is now a bug normal type inspired by another species of Orb Weaver Spiders found in Iceland, the ornamental Orb Weaver Spider. Its normal typing is to represent the fact that this species of spiders is not only harmless, but actually rather beneficial to farmers. It now takes inspiration from old spinning wheels that spin straw, but it obviously spins webbing instead. Sidereen Spydream evolves into the riding Pokemon, Sidereen Nightmarak. Nightmarak's webbing is said to be extremely strong, allowing those who ride it to climb mountains with ease. It is also the stuff of nightmares for those caught in its thick webbing. Once again, Nightmarak is a Pokemon originally found from my African Fakemon region known as the Luika region, and one of my favorite Pokemon and concepts I've come up with, which is why I just had to give it a new form. It keeps the same inspirations and typing as its pre-evolution, but takes it a little step further. Sidereen Nightmarak replaces Sneasler as the climbing ride Pokemon in the Cedar region. It allows you to scale mountains or cliffs by climbing them, but unlike Sneasler, whose movements were slow and tedious at times, Nightmarak can not only climb the cliffs, but can shoot webs to help you slingshot up it faster, Spider-Man style. Those of you who played the Spider-Man video games know exactly what I'm talking about. This riding mon will come in handy and be necessary to scale the area's large volcano. Another new variant you'll find in this area is the fire water type Sidereen Torkoal. It boils water inside of its shell, blowing out a geyser of scalding hot water when endangered. Sidereen Turkle is inspired by Iceland's iconic hot springs, geysers, and steam, with subtle changes to its colors and design to fit its new concept. Sidereen Turkle evolves into a brand new Pokemon, Lord of the Geyser, Eruptoise. The steam that erupts from its molten shell is said to boil at remarkably hot temperatures and come out with immense pressure. Eruptoise is another Icer Pokemon you must battle over a bunch of large, steaming hot geysers that will periodically go off damaging you. This battle will be very reminiscent of the Huisian Arcanine boss battle in Pokemon Legends Arceus, as you'll often be trapped in confined spaces due to the boiling hot water and erupting geysers that will challenge you in addition to Eruptoise's searing hot fire and water type attacks that you also must dodge. Next up we have the Rolling Highlands, which is probably the most unique, picturesque sector of the Cedar region, offering a variety of grassy and rocky terrains such as hills, cliffs, canyons, stone charons, and caves, not to mention the gorgeous rivers and waterfalls Iceland is known for. You'll find a variety of Pokemon of various different types here, including a new form for fan favorite pseudo-legendary Dragonite to mirror Gen 6 pseudo-legendary Gudra, received in Pokemon Legends Arceus. As I've always felt Gudra was a callback to Dragonite's big and derpy design. Sidereen Dragonite is now a Dragon Fairy type, Despite having the power to control the weather, these gentle giants are more interested in giving healing hugs to those they encounter stranded out at sea. Sidereen Dragonite is meant to look more like a natural evolution for Dragonair, taking elements from both it and the original Dragonite's design. Its antennas even make a heart shape. I think most Pokemon fans have imagined a more fitting evolution for Dragonair before at some point in time. I chose to give a regional only for the final stage of this line due to its concept being so reliant on being similar to Dragonair's original design. And I'm not too concerned with doing everything Legends Arceus did down to the T. So I felt like at the end of the day, as long as the pseudo, the final form itself, actually had a regional, that's all that really mattered. Dragon types get even more representation in the form of Sidereen Dredigan, a rock dragon type. They hide within the caves waiting for unsuspecting victims to ravage. Their scales are made of solid stone, allowing them to blend in with the caverns they reside in. This form was inspired by Dredigan's official classification as the cave Pokemon and Dex entry mentioning its connection to caves. I always wondered why it wasn't a rock type because of this, so I figured since this region takes place in the past, I thought it'd be cool to give it a more primitive form with the rock typing. Sidereen Dredigan evolves into a new Izire Pokemon, Lord of the Grotto, Gargoygon. 
They only emerge from caves at the dead of night using their spine-chilling stare to turn their prey to stone. Only a fool would anger this unruly Pokemon. This design is inspired by gargoyles and their stone statues. Gargoygon will present players with a really challenging boss battle as it hurls stones from the ceiling and charges at the trainer with an array of relentless attacks. In the Cedar region, you'll also be able to evolve Volibi into another riding Pokemon, the electric flying type, Cedarian Mandibuzz. Lightning is said to crash with a flap of their wings. They scope out their prey from the sky, paralyzing them before circling in to finish the job. Sidir and Mandibuzz was meant to mirror the previous Pokemon used to fly in Pokemon Legends Arceus, Hisuian Bravery, as Mandibuzz was always a counterpart to Bravery in Gen 5. This is something that Sidir and Mandibuzz's design subtly references with a similar color scheme and headpiece. Its design is also a reference to a terrifying bird found in Norse mythology. Not only is a vulture still a bird of prey like most depictions of this mythical beast, but it's a fun Pokemon-esque twist on the beast, as its carry-on qualities really fit its dark lure. The final explorable area of the Cedar region is known as the Ebony Islands, a series of onyx islands offshore from the region's beautiful black sand beaches inspired by those of Iceland. This is a heavy surfing area as most of this map is explorable not only on water, but more importantly underwater. Because of this there will be a wide variety of new Pokemon found swimming in the trenches and along the seafloor such as Ghost Electric type Sidir and Chinchou. Their antennae are illuminated by the souls lost at the bottom of the ocean. They wander the depths looking for any sign of life. This spooky design is meant to further resemble prehistoric fish such as the angler fish found in Icelandic waters. The changes in the design are subtle as you can see with the more ominous colors, the plus marks in its eyes tilted to X's to kind of sell that ghost typing, creepy little hands and fingers around its orbs, and more primitive looking fins. Sidirian Chinchow evolves into Sidirian Lantern. They use their bright lights to lure sailors lost at sea to the depths of the ocean to claim their souls. However, they are harmless to those who are pure of heart. Once again, this regional is meant to look a lot more primitive and ghastly, as it takes more inspiration from the anglerfish found in Icelandic waters. Sidirian Lantern is a new riding Pokemon and mechanic not previously found in Pokemon Legends Arceus, replacing the Ursaluna radar that now allows you to dive Gen 3 style and explore underwater areas while on Sidirian Lantern. Sidirian Lantern not only allows you to dive underwater, but the deeper you go underwater, the darker it will get. And Lantern will also act as Flash, as it was used in earlier games, helping to illuminate the darker areas around you. Underwater, you'll find a variety of Pokemon, including newcomers such as Grass Water type, Sidirian Oddish, as it went from being classified as the Weed Pokemon to the Seaweed Pokemon. Isolated at the bottom of the ocean, it is incredibly lonely, constantly searching for friends. This regional underwent small and subtle changes, such as a new seafoam green coloring and wavy seaweed-like hair. Sidirian Oddish evolves into Sidirian Gloom. When filled with sorrow, it releases a chemical from the top of its head to attract other Pokemon to play with it. The design now adds some sea anemone on its head, helping it to attract more of those friends it was so desperately seeking before. Now using the Water Stone in place of the Leaf Stone, Sidirian Gloom evolves into Sidirian Vioplume. They live on the seafloor where schools of smaller Pokemon, such as Finneon and Tynamo, find refuge on top of their head. Like Sidirian Gloom, Sidirian Vioplume is inspired by Sea Anemone, and unlike Sidirian Oddish, is no longer lonely, as it is now swarming with fishy friends thanks to the new habitat on its head. Of course, you'll also find Sidirian Chinchow at the depths of the ocean, as well as electric poison type, Sidirian Tentacle. Its stingers are coursing with electricity, which act as its greatest defense when threatened by Pokemon that lie at the depths of the ocean. This more eerie looking design is meant to resemble a jellyfish, even more as well as like a ghost drifting through the depths of the dark ocean. It evolves into the final Izire Pokemon, Lord of the Abyss, Sidirian Tentacruel. Sailors are terrified by tales of the havoc it wrecks on their ships using its electrically charged tentacles. It will live up to its name as Lord of the Abyss and deliver a gruesome battle in a sea cavern as you must not only avoid its tentacles and electric type attacks, but being poisoned as well, making for a super challenging fight. Its design and enlarged state in this fight is also a reference to the Kraken, which is huge in Norse mythology. As this is a Viking story and these are seafaring warriors, having a nice diverse ocean setting was very important to me, so the Ebony Islands will definitely deliver this and I feel is the perfect location to end your journey in the Cedar region.
Of course you'd face off against the Fearin Region's legendary Pokemon in this game, most of which inspired by gods and creatures from Norse mythology and the Icelandic poetic Edda, such as Ilruz and Stormer. These two would both play a prominent role in your journey through the Cedar Region, as you will pick one for the Voyage Clan to worship, as you embrace either the Way of Brain or Brawn. Unfortunately, at the time of making this video, I haven't even posted half of the Fearin region, so I can't really spoil all of the legendary Pokemon that reside in the Cedar or Fearin region, but I will say that there is about 14 of them total, most of which would be available in this hypothetical Pokemon Legends ROM doll, some of which may even be exclusive to this game's story and the Cedar region, like the new legendary bird Quatri. Life is said to blossom out of the most barren of wastelands with the flap of Quatri's wings, sending miraculous seeds and spores into the air. Quatri is the fourth legendary bird to complete the Kanto's trio meant to act as a counterpart to Enamorous from Pokemon Legends Arceus, which was a fourth weather genie. This is a fourth legendary bird being of the grass typing and following the same naming scheme as the other birds. Quatri and the rest of the legendary birds would be flying around the region as roaming adversaries you'd have to trap like the genies in Legends Arceus before actually battling them. Quatri and the other three legendary birds would all share a brand new signature move in the Cedar region called Element Burst, which is a flying type move, which would inflict a different status condition depending on the type of its user. For example, if Quatri were to use the move, it would poison the target. Whereas if Articuno were to use the move, it would inflict the target with the Frostbite status. If Zapdos were to use the move, it would paralyze the foe. And if Moltres were to use the move, it would obviously burn the foe. Last but not least, we have the title Pokemon, the all-powerful mythical Pokemon, Realmdoll. Sounding its majestic horn, Realmdoll can open a portal acting as a bridge between various realms. Realmdoll uses its reality-bending powers to guard all of these realms from those who seek to conquer or destroy them. So basically, that's what leads to the premise of the story, being as the Voyage Clan has recently settled in the Cedar region, Realmdoll feels that you're here to conquer it and might be a threat to the region causing it to give all of its power to the Azire Pokemon to help defend the region. This mythical Pokemon is clearly the center of the Cedar region story, as the title suggests, but could also be acquired in the modern day Fearin region's Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn through an event. Its design is inspired by both Arceus itself, with a similar white, gold, and black color scheme, and quadrupedal design. It's also important to note that it looks and resembles a horse, not only to reference Arceus's design, but because Helmdahl is commonly associated with horses. No, it is not a Thanos horse. I repeat, it is not a Thanos horse. It is actually inspired by another character found in the MCU, and more importantly, Norse mythology, the Norse god Helmdahl who guards the Bifrost Bridge. The colorful jewels throughout its design, which are most likely giving you Infinity Stone vibes, are actually a reference to the rainbow colors of the Bifrost Bridge, whereas the gold armor is also not supposed to be a reference to Thanos, but Norse god Helmdahl's golden armor throughout many of his interpretations. Realmdahl's signature ability is like Arceus's, allowing it to change type using a type melody you give it, and its signature move works just like Judgment, changing to match its given type as well. In its boss battle, which would of course be a challenge as the final boss, it would even change types so that its signature move is always super effective, just like Judgment did using the Legend Plate in Legends Arceus. This of course would be due to a held item, similar to the Legend Plate, called the Legend Melody. Also, much how there were random time-space distortions in Legends Arceus, there would be a new and similar phenomenon in the Cedar region created by Realmdahl known as Reality Distortions. This of course would be a reference to the Nine Realms of Norse Mythology, and each distortion would transform its occupied space to resemble one of the Nine Realms, with its spawn Pokemon being tailor-fitted to its biome. So basically, you could be in the ocean area, on an island, and if you're in this reality distortion, it could be covered in snow or fire, whatever. These rare reality distortions, much like the time-space distortions, would also offer rare items and Pokemon, with some of which even being exclusive to these occurrences, like the Fearin region's yet-to-be-revealed fossils, or the Frenian forms which don't yet exist and would be found in the region's future. For those of you not familiar with my Fakemon region, the Fearin region, and its brand new mechanic Forge Forms, please go back and watch some of my previous videos to learn more. But because I'd like this to be a one-stop shop video, I'm gonna give you a quick abbreviated version of the mechanic. So here we go. 
Using an ancient magical item known as the Battle Bracer, certain Pokemon are turned into magical living weapons, Soul Eater style, that trainers can use to join the battle, guided and protected by the aura of the Pokemon they are wielding. This mechanic was not only inspired by Vikings and their weapons, but the many magical weapons from Norse mythology, many of which being introduced in Iceland's poetic Edda and sagas. Although it was ironically Pokemon Legends Arceus that helped inspire Forge Forms, as that game evolved the franchise in a more mature direction. By this I'm referring to the fact that Pokemon were able to now attack trainers and even make them faint. They mentioned death in the game. You have Pokemon like Cleaver whose arms are literally weapons that could cut a real human in half in real life, but don't seem to kill the trainers within the game as it's a nonsensical fantasy world that already defies all logic. So using a forge form weapon against a Pokemon would be no different and follow the same flawed logic where no blood would be shed. I think a lot of people forget to realize that the Pokemon world is void of real logic. This would just make the region function more like a typical RPG similar to what Legends Arceus already did. Being this whole project was inspired by Pokemon Legends Arceus, I wanted to expand upon that more. Forge Form is also a feature that this game would explore in great fashion as you not only no longer have to just throw bombs at Pokemon in boss battles to weaken them, but instead could use a Forge Form to do so as well, speeding up the process. This would offer a new and more RPG style experience to the boss battles that we already got in Legends Arceus, as you also battle other trainers using Forge Forms, or can use your Forge Forms to bounce back certain attacks. I just wanted to do something different and the mechanic fits the Fearin region and the Cedar region perfectly. However, with Pokemon Legends Romdale being an origin story for Pokemon Brain and Brawn, with the Cedar region being a past version of the Fearin region, the story of Pokemon Legends Romdale would explore the origins of the Forge Form mechanic, what it is exactly, where it comes from, and why it is considered so taboo and seen as barbaric in modern day Fearin. Whereas in a dangerous time, such as that of Pokemon Legends Romdale, this wouldn't be as frowned upon as once again, Cedar is inspired by the Viking expansion and the Vikings that founded the country of Iceland, known for their barbaric ways. So in other words, Forge Forms would be a huge part of Pokemon Legends Realmdale's story and hypothetical game, just as it is in the Fearin region and Pokemon Brain and Brawn. Forge Forms are classified by four different weapon types, you have Wrecker types, being weapons used to smash or beat the foe in, such as hammers and maces. You have Slasher types, being sharp weapons such as swords and axes, used to cut the foe. There are Defender types, being multi-purpose shields used to protect yourself from attacks and charge at foes. And the most versatile being the Piercer type, being weapons such as bow and arrows or spears that stab the foe with great precision. Each having their own in-battle and out-of-battle advantages. In battle, they act as your held item when wielding a forge form, with the weapon bonus helping to boost one of your stats depending on the type of weapon you are using. While dealing damage with a forge form, you also build up what's called forge force, as you have a gauge that once you max out, allows you to use an ultimate move called a finisher move. This is similar to Z moves and obviously G max moves, etc. But unlike those, can be used over again as long as you fill your gauge again. Pokemon Legends Realm Doll would include most of the Forge forms in Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn found in the future Fearin region, as well as 10 new Forge forms exclusive to this game and the Cedar region. The new Forge forms include Sidereon Chestnut, being an Iron Mace of the Wrecker type, Sidereon Embor, being a Flaming Shield of the Defender type, Sidereon Empoleon, being a Majestic Sword of the Slasher type, Glacix being a massive ice hammer of the Wrecker type, Sidereon Whimsicott being a thorny spear of the Piercer type, Sidereon Eruptois being a steaming cannon shield of the Defender type, Sidereon Gargoygon being a scary stone axe of the Slasher type, Sidereon Tentacruel being a bow that shoots magic electrical arrows of the Piercer type, Sidereon Dragonite being an adorable hammer of the Wrecker type, and last but not least, the title Pokemon, Realm Doll, being a mystical multicolor sword of the slasher type. This is a reference to the beautiful Bifrost Bridge, Norse god Helmdall is sworn to guard and Helmdall's iconic sword from Norse mythology, as Realm Doll is inspired by Helmdall. This would also act as the ultimate weapon in the game, and final reward for beating the final boss, Realm Doll. So which of these forge forms would be your secret weapon in the Cedar region? Please leave me a comment down below to let me know, I love to see it. And if you'd like to see many of my other Forge Forms, please make sure to check out my previous videos and my Instagram page, at Mycomon underscore regions.
One of the most interesting new features of Pokemon Legends Arceus, at least to me, was the introduction of ancestors to iconic characters throughout the Pokemon world. It was fun piecing together or trying to guess who each character was related to. As you've already seen in this game, being as it's a Legends project, it would once again introduce ancestors to several characters from various regions throughout the Pokemon franchise, as well as characters from my own Fakemon regions, primarily the Furin region. I picked ancestors I felt not only fit the region, but the story I wanted to tell with this project. Of course, given my limited resources, I couldn't actually show you every ancestor that would be featured in this hypothetical Legends game, just the ones that excited me most and I felt were the most relevant to the story. So please note, there would be plenty of more ancestors in this hypothetical game than the ones I'm actually showing you. But here are some of the others I've personally thought about residing in the Cedar region, but didn't actually include in this video. I'll let your imagination do the rest of the work and imagine how they'd actually appear in the Cedar region. There would even be some cameos from some Pokemon Legends Arceus characters, such as Volo, who would act as one of the game's secret bosses once again, but this time wielding Garchomp's Forge Form being a scythe. A Forge Form weapon that would also be present in modern day Furin, used by his descendant, Champion Cynthia. Anyways, you've seen the heroes and Professor Magnolia, but let's start off by taking a deeper look at the Voyage Clan. Meet the revered leader of the Voyage Clan, Victor. Victor is an ancestor to the future Furin region rival, Stefan or Christine. Behind his tough exterior and intimidating physique, he is actually a big teddy bear who would do anything to protect the members of the Voyage Clan. Having rescued you out at sea, Victor immediately senses your strength, hoping to hone it as he welcomes you into the Voyage Clan, as long as you can prove yourself useful. Victor's father trained him to fight from an early age, telling him to take what he wanted in life and not let anyone or anything stand in his way. Having witnessed his father's untimely death at the hands of a provoked wild Pokemon, Victor has since made it his mission to harness the raw power of Pokemon in search of a home to settle down with a family of his own. This is what drove him to create the Voyage Clan. While a fierce battler and skilled Forge Form user, Victor's strength is hindered by the fact he only sees Pokemon as threats or weapons to be used by humans. Victor will use and fully evolve all three of the future Fair and Region starter Pokemon, Barry, Faloga, and Krabub, as it is he who will end up establishing these three Pokemon as the starter Pokemon of the region after finally acknowledging the powerful bond he has formed with these three Pokemon, thanks to you of course. Hoping that the future trainers who set out on adventures in the region will be able to form a similar bond with these Pokemon. The Forge Form weapon Victor wields will be that of one of the fully evolved Fearin starters determined by the Sidereian starter that you selected, so it will always be the starter with the type super effective to yours. So for example, if you picked Chespin and end up with Sidereian Chestnut, he will end up using his Selder's Forge form in battle. As I'm sure you can all tell just looking at him, Victor can take a hit, meaning most of your attacks will barely phase him, while his attacks will hit even harder, knocking off a huge chunk of your health. So it is vital you maintain a healthy distance from him as much as possible. He will provoke you a lot, waiting for you to strike, but don't underestimate him because there will be times where he will charge at you aggressively as well. The best way to weaken him is to use your own forge form to reflect his own elemental attacks back at him. If you look closely, you'll notice there's an element from all three fully evolved fear and starter Pokemon in Victor's design as a nod to his team. He's wearing a green pelt similar to Berserker's, a red belt reminiscent of the fire pattern on his Zelda's body, and a Viking helmet similar to the one on Vicrab's head. This also foreshadows Victor's change of heart towards Pokemon, as it is a clear indicator of the bond he feels for these three Pokemon, even if it's not apparent to him yet. Another vital character in the story would be Yudun, who is an ancestor of future Fear and Elite 4 member and Dark type specialist Isaac. Like Isaac, she is a formidable fighter and Forge Form wielder using the same ace Pokemon and Forge Form as her descendant, Rasko Raid. Extremely cunning and strategic, she masterfully uses whatever is at her disposal to exploit her foe's weaknesses. Yudun is a Voyage Clan leader, helping to lead the expedition side of things, similar to Captain Silene's role in Pokemon Legends Arceus. While Victor chose to welcome you into the Voyage Clan after rescuing you out at sea, she is, understandably, suspicious of the circumstances of your mysterious arrival. Victor has tasked her to train you in how not only to battle Pokemon, but use a Forge Form, much how her descendant Isaac will be tasked to train the future protagonist of the Fearin region how to use a Forge Form. 
Reluctant to do so, she sees this as an opportunity not only to test your strength, but to keep an eye on you. As you move up the ranks in the Voyage Clan and prove yourself to be a vital asset to the clan, she will grow even more suspicious of you and even a little jealous, as she fears you could replace her. Expect her to challenge you at every turn of your journey as she's waiting for you to slip up. As I already mentioned her sneaky and cunning battle skills, just imagine those being used against you in a boss battle. Wielding her Rasquerade Sword, Udun's sword attacks are swift and precise, as she will constantly use her Rasquerade's dark powers to disappear into the shadows, only appearing when ready to attack. So the best way to land a hit against her is to defend and counter her own attacks, leaving her vulnerable for a short period of time. She would provide a fast-paced battle guaranteed to keep you on your toes. Let's meet another familiar face with Oliver. Oliver is a simple farmer coming to the Cedar region from the Galar region with the Voyage Clan to make something of himself. As I'm sure you could probably tell, Oliver is an ancestor of both Champion Leon and his younger brother Hop from the Galar region. His personality is more reminiscent of Hop's as he has something to prove. But like Leon, he has a natural bond with Pokemon, causing him to side with you and some of the others like Alva and Professor Magnolia as you start to advocate for a more harmonious relationship between humans and Pokemon. Oliver's partner Pokemon since arriving in the Firin region is a feisty flam, reminiscent of Hop's Wulu with the fiery spirit of Leon's Charizard. Coming from the Galar region together, Oliver has taken quite the liking to Professor Sarah Magnolia, but given their difference in ranks and the fact he considers himself to be a nobody farmer, he is far too shy to ever speak to her. Since Leon has always been portrayed as this all-powerful and undefeated champion that kind of came out of nowhere if you ask me, I felt it would be nice to give him some humble origins. This way it is clear all of Oliver's hard work and ambition is one day rewarded as his descendant Leon becomes one of the greatest trainers of all time. This is my attempt to make Leon's all-star status feel a little more earned. Oliver is a good man and would be an even better ally to you on your journey through the Cedar region. Does this character look familiar at all? Meet Axel. Axel is another one of Team Voyage's expedition leaders, looking to weaponize Pokemon's power and understand the phenomenon that is Forge Forms. Axel's role would be similar to Commander Kamado's in Pokemon Legends Arceus. Axel, as I'm sure you guessed, is an ancestor to the iconic Alolan family, made up of Gladion, Lily, and Luzamine. If you haven't picked up on this by now, most of the ancestors I created for this project are related to more than one character, as I felt this would be a lot more exciting creatively. While Axel greatly admires your power and hopes to use it to his advantage, he grows to fear it, as he doesn't agree with your soft stance on the relationship between Pokemon and people, as he sees them as nothing but a threat to humanity or a weapon to be used for personal gain. Axel is cold and calculated, always thinking three steps ahead of his enemies. Yudun also being another Voyage Clan leader who is rather weary of you, betrays Voyage Clan leader Victor as she and Axel both feel he's grown too soft. Yudun is loyal to Axel and his plans as she feels he is more fit to lead the Voyage Clan into the future, as he is willing to do whatever is necessary to achieve power, a trait she once admired in Leader Victor. That was until you came onto the scene, of course. Axel being the main antagonist would end up succeeding in his goal to harness the power of Pokemon by capturing one of Firin's mascot legendaries after you've weakened it in battle. Talk about Shady, you do all the legwork and he reaps all the benefits. The divine Pokemon he captures being either the trickster Pokemon Ilruz or mighty Pokemon Stormer, depending on which of these deities you chose to worship on your adventure, the path of Brain or Brawn. In your battle against Axel, he will use the powerful forge form of this captured divine Pokemon to unleash a string of relentless lightning or darkness based attacks that engulf most of the battlefield, so you can't let up for a second or you're a goner. One of my personal favorite ancestors for this project, and one of the region's guardians, is Alva, an ancestor to the iconic dragon specialists Claire and Lance as they are cousins. The design mostly draws inspiration from Claire as I felt her more feminine features and color palette fits more with Sidereian Dragonite's design and color palette. Alva is guardian of the Lord of the Grotto, found within the Rolling Highlands. Alva is fun-loving and fearless, always rushing headfirst into danger with a smile on her face. She is drawn to Dragon-type Pokémon, and is certain that even the scariest of Pokémon have love in their hearts. She's often seen with her best friend and ace Pokémon, Sidereon Dragonite, by her side. This is something most people in the Cedar region at this time are uncomfortable with, even those fortunate enough to have their own Pokémon, as they feel Pokémon are dangerous. 
Having mastered the mysterious forge form mechanic, Alva has come to the conclusion that even when wielding her Dragonite as a literal weapon, it is their unbreakable bond that makes them unstoppable. If you're wondering why you don't see the Voyage Clan symbol on her outfit, it's because Alva is an outcast of the Voyage Clan who was banished shortly after the clan's arrival in the Cedar region, as she doesn't agree with their harsh views of Pokemon, let alone how poorly they treat their own Pokemon. Before befriending her, she will initially see you as a foe, being as you're a member of the Voyage Clan, and will attack you as she's trying to defend the Izire enraged Gargoygon, as she fears Team Voyage is only trying to harness its power, and transform it into a Forge Form weapon to be wielded, as they have all the other Izire Pokemon they captured so far with your assistance. Alva will use her adorable Dragonite Hammer to fly around the battlefield and avoid attacks, waiting for the ideal moment to get the drop on you from above and smash. The best way to knock her out of the sky is to reflect her weapon's mystic wind tornadoes she shoots down from the sky back at her. Determined to prove yourself to her and do the right thing, you allow her to capture the enraged Gargoygon you defeat. Team Voyage obviously doesn't take this well, but after discovering you're working with Alva, Udun and Axel are determined to get you banished from the Voyage Clan as well. However, unlike Legends Arceus' twist banishing, they will fail to do so, as Victor will side with you, leading them to betray Victor and divide the Voyage Clan as some will side with them out of fear or ignorance, while others will remain loyal to Victor. This is not only a big moment in the story, but a nod to the Fearin region as division and duality is the main theme of the region. Alva and Professor Magnolia look to you to help them convince the rest of Team Voyage that Pokemon and humans can come together as one to do unimaginable things. If you've made it this far into the video, I'd like to take this moment to apologize for any words I may have mispronounced. I know this is a long video, like a really long video, and I don't want anyone to miss anything or feel lost. Nor do I trust myself not to miss or forget to say something. Anyways, bear with me as I'd like to give a quick recap of all the Berserk, Izire Pokemon you'd battle in the Cedar region, as well as the Riding Pokemon you'd use to help traverse the region on your adventure. Let's start with the Izire Pokemon that you'd have to defeat throughout your journey. In the Aurora Icelands, you'd encounter the Lord of the Boral, Glacix, who you'd fight on a series of moving icebergs, some of which Glacix will destroy, either stranding you or causing you to drown, like you would in Pokemon Legends Arceus when exposed to water. Glacix will also dive into the Arctic waters, much like Crystal Onyx did in the anime, to avoid your attacks, so be prepared to launch its own ice ball attacks back at it, using a forge form in order to deal massive amounts of damage and temporarily leave it vulnerable. In the floral field lands, you'll face off against the Lady of the Valley, the prickly Sidereian Whimsicott, who will bombard you with a series of thorn attacks that will float through the air honing in on you. This will make it hard to land an attack as you're constantly moving, however if you time and position things just right, you'll be able to use your forge form to fling one of these spike balls back at it, dealing massive amounts of damage and weakening it long enough to engage in battle. In the Scorched Wastelands, you'll battle the blazing hot Lord of the Geyser, Eruptoys, in a ring of steaming hot geysers. These geysers will periodically go off, damaging you and burning the first Pokemon in your party. In addition to these ticking time bombs, you'll also have to avoid a series of scolding hot steam and water based attacks, often leaving you with little to no space to move. Your best chance to strike is once again to use your forge form to deflect a Ruptoise's steam based attack back at it. In the Rolling Highlands, you'll be pushed to your limits by the Lord of the Grotto, Gargoygon who will unleash a series of relentless attacks. However, you can stop Gargoygon in its tracks, at least long enough to fight back, by using your Forge Form weapon to knock stalagmites off the cavern wall down onto it. Last but not least, you'll face your toughest battle yet as you must defeat the Lord of the Abyss, the terrifying Sidereian Tentacruel, in an underwater cavern. Tentacruel will dive underwater to avoid your attacks, but will still be able to strike you using its tentacles from below. You and your team must overcome both electric and poison type attacks, making this battle especially tricky, as Tentacruel hides in the depths, stalling you as you're poisoned. But if you can manage to counter one of its tentacle attacks using your forge form, you can gain the upper hand. As for the riding Pokemon used to help traverse the Cedar region, you have Sidir and Go-Goat used to dash and leap around the region with great speed, you also have Horasi, used to sail the Cedar region's open waters and explore a series of uninhabited islands in search of rare treasures and Pokemon. 
Sidiri Nightmarak can be used to scale the Cedar region's monstrous mountains and cliffs with great ease, using webbing to help slingshot you up higher. Sidirian Lantern can be used to dive into the dark depths of the seas surrounding the Cedar region, also helping to illuminate your way the deeper you go and the darker it gets. And finally, Sidirian Mandibuzz can be used to soar through the skies of the Cedar region, and you'll also be able to use its electric attacks to strike down other Pokemon in the sky, making it easier to capture or battle them. Okay, you all know the drill by now. Hit the like button, hit the notification bell to keep up with more content, and of course, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Also, please make sure to go follow and support all of the incredible artists listed in the bio below. I commissioned them to create these incredible artworks. I had a pleasure working with them. They did a phenomenal job. None of this would be possible without them, and they deserve all the love in the world. So please, please, please make sure to go follow and support them as well. There we are. I really hope you all enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it and sharing it with you. I'm so proud of this project. I hope it resonates with all of you. If it did, please leave a comment down below to let me know what you think. Let me know what your favorite Pokemon in this project was, what your favorite Forge form is, who your favorite ancestor is. I'd love to see what you all have to say. It makes my day reading through your comments and... Yeah, this is why I do it. So thank you so much for all of your support and making it this far through this behemoth of a video. <laughs> I, um, myself personally, it's hard for me to sit through long videos like this because I've got a short attention span. So I'm hoping all of you don't have that problem. Now that the Pokemon Legends Realm Doll project and the Cedar region is finished, I'm gonna start fading it out on Instagram and get right back into the Furin region. There's more than half of the Pokedex still to explore. Plenty of new Pokemon, new evolutions, characters, legendaries, and forge forms to introduce. I'm so excited for this second chapter of the Fear and region and to get back into that. Of course, my Pokemon fan games, Order and Chaos for the Luiko region are still in the works as well. I can't wait to see you all again and have a new video out here shortly as we dive back into the Fear and region. Have a great one.